Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. Uh, this video is second in a continuous series in which we show Muhammad Hijab's straw man, intellectual dishonesty, and lack of understanding about Islamic philosophical tradition, falsafa. Today we are going to discuss a very important issue uh, in this regard, that is Avicidah's definition of contingency and Hijab's blatant and deliberate misrepresentation and misinterpretation of Avicidah's argument in an attempt to save his intellectually corrupted, unsupported and debunked Tuhid of Athari school and his spiritual father Ibn Taymiyyah. Please keep in mind that Muhammad Hijab shows this intellectual dishonesty because he believes, as all Atharis do, that divine simplicity, the belief that all of God's attributes are one and identical to each other in their reality, which is called uh, uh, in Arabic as Sufatuhu Ainadatuhu, is Kufr. It is laughable already that Muhammad Hijab has to uh, take his defense of Islam from Avicenna, who is labeled as a kafir by his own school. But what is even more questionable, uh, but not unexpected, is that he misrepresents the argument of Avicenna just to avoid the necessary entailments of the argument. So uh, let us get into this analysis. Uh, as you might all know that Muhammad Hijab recently wrote a small book to explain Avicenna's contingency argument. He, and he also claims that he is going to do a PhD in Avicenna's contingency argument. Uh, the name of the book is uh, The Burhan Argument uh, for a Necessary Being Inspired by Islamic Thought. At some points, the book is uh, satisfactory and it uh, does a fine job to present the argument in the first few pages but what is very relevant to this discussion is that uh, uh, Muhammad Hijab at one point uh, is being absolutely dishonest and tries to fetch in the definition from Ibn Taymiyyah into Avicenna's argument just to avoid the necessary entailments of divine simplicity. Before pointing out the mistake and intellectual dishonesty of Muhammad Hijab let me explain what philosophers and mystics uh, mean by when they say that they believe in uh, divine simplicity at the first place. They mean that there is no ontological plurality within God such that God is an absolutely simple entity. All the attributes of God refer to the same signified, the same reality that is his essence. While it is true that the attributes are meaningfully and conceptually different from each other in their meaning and how humans imagine them, but they are not distinct in how they refer to the same reality and uh, within the divine essence. Uh, uh, and they subsist in absolute unity within the divine essence. Atharis do not believe this because they believe that even at the plane of divine essence, the attributes are distinct from each other and entail a plurality of aspects within the divine essence. Avicenna, in his works such as Al Isharat, Fal Tambihat, Al Ilahiyat, Bin Shifa, clearly argues that divine simplicity is, necess is a necessary entailment of the contingency argument, or put it even more clearly, Clearly, the necessary existence that Avicenna approves through his arguments is by definition an absolutely simple reality that has no internal multiplicity. Hijab is either ignorant about Avicenna's position, which I honestly do not think is the case, as I will show you some videos where he is accepting that he uh, actively misrepresents Avicenna's argument, or Hijab is uh, deliberately misrepresenting Avicenna's argument uh, in order to save his Athari position, which I think is a is an act of great intellectual dishonesty. It is absolutely fine if he wants to disagree with Avicenna as long as uh, he provides an actual argument against him, but to simply and blatantly misguide people by claiming to present Avicenna's argument and then changing the goalpost halfway through the book is nothing but intellectual dishonesty. On page 23 of his book, he smuggles in the definition of Ibn Taymiyyah that anything that can be detached from the whole is the part and the anything that does not have a part is a necessary existent because it cannot be in any other way. I am just going to demonstrate how this conception of what a part is is not consistent with the Avicennian view. For 
for Avicenna, an existent is contingent, is a contingent existent if it is possible in itself, such that there is some other existent that must necessarily exist ontologically prior to this existent for it to exist, and the non-existence of some other existent that is not numerically identical to it implies the non-existence of this existence. There, these are both the possible ways in which Avicenna's definition of contingency can be framed. Now, even if there is a whole that has parts such that all parts are necessary in their own self, uh, something that is impossible in the first place because the plurality of multiple necessary existence is impossible, so there cannot be uh, multiple necessary beings. But even if we grant that, even then the whole sh would be considered in its own essence would be contingent because for the whole to exist but the parts would have to exist and the whole can only and only exist if the things that are numerically distinct to it such as its parts exist prior to it this makes the whole in its own self contingent and the proposition that the whole exists also becomes contingent because it is only true true when some other propositions are true such as the parts exist now for Avicenna uh, he would absolutely agree that the whole can still be wajib, right? As uh, uh, Muhammad Hijab mentions in his books, uh, in his book uh, by mentioning Ibn Taymiyyah, that he believes that the attributes are go of God are necessary because of uh, the, uh, their necessity, uh, because they cannot be in any other way. Avicenna would also ag uh, agree with this, but for him, even if something is uh, uh, cannot be otherwise, it can still be contingent, uh, contingent in its own self, right? Because Avicenna, uh, who is correcting Ibn Taymiyyah and who knows people like Ibn Taymiyyah, has a very nuanced definition of what a necessity is. So for uh, Avicenna, the, the necessity is of two types. One type is wajib bil ghair. Right? Necessity through another. Something which Ibn Taymiyyah confuses with wajib bizzat. The thing that is necessary in itself. Uh, for example, I can give you an example. Let us imagine that P depends upon Q to exist. Right? And whenever P exists, P necessarily substantiates and actualizes the existence of Q. Now, Q in its own self is contingent such that it cannot exist on its own. But since... P necessarily exists and necessarily causes Q to exist. Q necessarily exists as well, right? But Q in its own essence is absolutely contingent and devoid of existence. So just because Q cannot be in any other way, that does not mean that Q is necessary in its own self. This is the point that Ibn Taymiyyah and Muhammad Hijab either do not understand or do not want to understand because it proves that their God, that what they believe in, is not necessary in its own self, is not necessary, is not wajib bizzat, rather it is wajib al ghayr because it depends upon other existence to exist. To, every, to Avicenna, everything is wajib because he is a necessitarian. The objective of the argument uh, presented by Avicenna was to prove prove a wajib bizzat, a necessity in itself. And Muhammad Hijab, by changing the definition of a necessity and contingency, has defeated the very purpose of the argument. That was to prove wajib bizzat, not a wajib, uh, or a wajib bil ghair, or wajib through another. If one believes that the attribute of God are distinct pluralities, concretely different, and not numerically identical to each other in the ontological sense, then... God becomes contingent because for God to exist, his, his parts, his attributes would have to exist first such that the amalgamation of all the attributes creates God. And that view sounds very similar to the Christian doctrine of Trinity. The absurdity and logical impossibility of there being multiple necessary existence still stands as well. Ibn Taymiyyah mentions that attributes could not have been otherwise, so they must be necessary in their own existence. If that is the case, then under Ibn Taymiyyah's definition, everything is God for Avicenna because 
uh, because Avicenna believes that everything is necessary, everything is wajib. Either it is necessary in its own self, wajib is that, or uh, necessary through another, wajib al ghayr. Ibn Taymiyyah tried to present a definition of necessity as something that could not have been otherwise. If we take this definition, then uh, for Avicenna, every existent, uh, every existence is God, or every existent is wajib. Muhammad Hijab mentions uh, this definition of Ibn Taymiyyah in his booklet as well, and changes the definition of Avicenna into the definition of uh, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah and that is a very conscious move because he knows if he takes the definition of Avicenna then he would have to believe in divine simplicity because for Avicenna the thing that is necessary in its own self is indeed absolutely simple. So Muhammad Hijab and his Taymiyyah group that is trying to use this absurd definition of what a part is without any uh, understanding of uh, Ibn uh, Avicenna's definition of uh, uh, contingency, necessity, contingent in itself, wajib in itself, wajib through another, uh, should you know, just leave contingency argument and negate uh, divine simplicity rather than being uh, uh, intellectually dishonest and uh, misrepresenting Avicenna's argument. Muhammad Hijab literally cites a normal English dictionary, not a philosophical work, to support his definition of what a piece is. That is a highly unintellectual move. This is as low as one can get to somehow prove their point and defend their view. It is not the case either that Hijab does not know about the necessary entailments of Avicenna's view in his recent London talks. He has made it clear that he realizes the supposed problem with Avicenna's argument. Even after this, he tries his best to misrepresent it and somehow make it uh, compatible with his views. A thing which cannot be done because of its logical impossibility. One more problem with their definition of a part is their inability to, to demonstrate any argumentation against someone that posits that universe itself is an independent existence and energy can neither be created nor be destroyed. In this way, no part of universe can be taken away from it. Right? To such an objection, these people would be totally dumbfounded. They believe that everything is God kind of thing. Yes. And so he's denying that that the universe is even made up of parts. He's saying that, like, you know, why do we just kind of see it in this way, but it's not parts. So how would you prove hmm. to that the universe, I guess we don't come wrong, is that it's a good, It's a very good question. Right, so we need to define what a part is. Okay. Now, in the, in the study of muriology, there are about 10 or 11 definitions of part. About 10 or, def or, 10 or 11 definitions of part. The way in which I will end up making this argument is that a part is basically what is defined in the vernacular as a piece, a piece of something. A piece is something which is susceptible to uh, as assembly or disassembly, like something which can be attached to something or detached from something, broken up. This is what I mean by piece. And it's important to define a piece or a part in that way, but there are other ways of defining a part. So, for example, if I say, um, I'm part of this class, or... It's different from me saying that a part of my dissertation was X, Y, and Z. Or a part of my work. You, in the vernacular, it can be used in, in different ways. So you have to be careful what we mean by it. What we mean by it, which is not what Ibn Sina means by it, by the way. I will explain why, Yani. Ibn Sina's definition is actually problematic of what a part is. Al-Ghazali mentions that. I'm going to just pre yani, preempt this because I don't want people using a wrong argument. Is that... His, his definition of part may include the attributes of God. That's why you have to be careful. So Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah said you have to define it like this. If you want to make this, you know, you go, you go to define it like this. And that's why um, a part is something, because none of the attributes of God can be attached or detached from God. It's impossible. Okay. So a part is basically a piece. What we, when we say part, we're talking about a piece. If you look in the dictionary of what the word piece means in the dictionary, that's what we mean by a part. But Ibn Sina, it could be argued that his definition of part includes the godly attributes. And in fact, this was not just Ibn Taymiyyah. Al-Ghazali attacked him for this as well. In fact, in his Tehafut al falasifa the incoherence of the philosophers, Al-Ghazali massively attacked him. On your point, 
of the universe could be. It doesn't. It's not composed of parts. I don't think anyone can make that. It's a merely logically redundant argument. It's an impossible argument to say the universe has no parts, unless he's defining part in a way which is merely logically impossible. I mean, no one would define it like that. People who are pantheists in the past, the most prominent of them, like Spinoza, he was a pantheist. I'm not sure if you know who Spinoza is. He was a very he was a heavyweight philosopher in the 17th century, 16th, 17th century. He existed at the same time, I think, as Leibniz. And he basically said God is everywhere. He believed it. And he was excommunicated from the Jewish uh, community because of that. He's, they, they said no to Wahdat al Wujud. Now some Muslims are saying, some Muslims are accepting this and speaking about it. But even the Jews said, this guy's, uh, forget him, he's finished. As you can see clearly in this video that Muhammad Hijab or anyone who does not agree with the definition presented by Avicenna and tries to misrepresent it would not be able to answer a uh, pantheist and because in their belief if the necessary existence can be composite then the universe itself can be a which is a composite can be a necessary existence. You cannot escape this unless you adopt the definition that is presented by Avicenna. And another thing that you can see is that their uh, misunderstanding of uh, uh, people like Snoza or their misunderstanding of uh, complex doctrines like uh, Wahdat al-Wujud, which were uh, propagated and believed by many Islamic philosophers, uh, in even those who followed the uh, school of Avicenna or even after that, Mullah Sadra, Shahabuddin Sahrawardi, Ibn Arabi, and so on and so forth. So it is absolutely disingenuous of these people to use arguments from our Islamic uh, philosophical and theosophical and mystical tradition and then go on and call us panentheists and call us kafirs. One can read Avicenna directly as well uh, to reach the same conclusion that contingency argument entails divine simplicity. For example, in Ilahiyat with Shifa, the metaphysics of healings, uh, Avicenna writes on page 297, book uh, 8, chapter 7, uh, If the attributes of the first, the truth, are apprehended and intellectually in this matter, nothing will be found in them that would necessitate parts or multiplicity for his essence in any manner whatsoever. Hence, the will of the necessary existent does not differ in essence from his knowledge, nor does it differ in meaning from his knowledge. For we have shown that the knowledge belonging to him is identical with the will that belongs to him. Likewise, it has become evident that the power belonging to him consists in his essence being an intellectual apprehender of the whole in such a way that the apprehension is the principle of the whole, not derived from the whole, and the principle in itself not dependent on the existence of anything. This will, in the form of that we have uh, ascertained, which is not connected with a purpose within the emanation of existence, is nothing other than the emanation itself. Right, so Avicenna also clearly mentions divine simplicity uh, in his works as well. So I ask Ibn uh, Muhammad uh, Hijab and his supporters to sincerely think about this issue and to read Sheikh Raiz himself and uh, not to bring in Ibn Taymiyyah's definition uh, into uh, Avicenna's work and to treat Avicenna's argument as his own and accept its necessary entailments. If they do not want to accept the necessary entailments of the contingency argument, then what they can do is to simply reject it and present a solid rebuttal of this argument. I ask all of you to uh, sincerely think about this issue and uh, see how this person is misrepresenting uh, Islamic philosopher and uh, uh, to support us in, in this series and please share and subscribe if you like this video inshallah we will be doing more videos like this and presenting thoroughly the views of uh, the authentic views of uh, philosopher and we will not let these people own the discourse and uh, present their own distorted and misinformed versions of of, uh, the contingency argument and Islamic philosophy just to fit their own agenda. Uh, thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked it, please uh, like, share and subscribe and comment, share your thoughts. Uh, thank you very much. Ma'as-salama.